Great, thank you very much, Guy. I was standing outside, so I didn't hear what you said, so hopefully you said nice things. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here at the Union, and it's lovely to be back in Oxford. Um, they say timing is everything, um, and I think it's certainly good timing for this, for this session. So the topics that I want to talk about, um, advertised here, um, are very much on the news agenda. Uh, and the political, ag political agenda too, and uh, are very much growing uh, in importance. I was invited originally to talk about the Financial Times and how we have navigated um, the digital transformation and the turmoil uh, in news media um, in recent years, and I'm always very happy uh, to talk about the FT, um, but I think the issues that matter in media um, go much broader and deeper than the FT or any uh, individual title. So while I will refer to our strategy uh, and our fortunes at the FT, I will spend most of my time on the information ecosystem that we're part of, and that has evolved uh, so rapidly with such profound and problematic implications for politics uh, and society. Uh, if I was here a few years back, um, I'd have probably been a lot more upbeat uh, about that ecosystem. I'd have brought plausible theories uh, about why the digital revolution was a positive force, uh, arming voters with more information, uh, creating constructive and engaged communities. And I could have cited some evidence, the positive role of Twitter uh, in the Arab Spring, for instance, and more recently, the Me Too uh, movement. Indeed, the idea of bypassing traditional gatekeepers in news and society uh, felt uh, like a potentially exciting uh, liberation. But overall, I think this positive picture has been uh, subverted. It's given way to a realization of the abuse um, and corruption of the information sector with fake news, electoral interference, data abuse and manipulation, all rightly raising real social concerns. Indeed, sometimes it seems that the producers of the House of Cards the Manchurian Candidate and the Parallax View got together to develop uh, a new movie. If you haven't seen the Parallax View, by the way, it's one of Alan Pakula's uh, excellent 1970s political paranoia thrillers. I highly recommend it. So that's what we'll be talking about. Um, and I mean we, because I want this to be interactive and to take as many questions as possible. So while I'm talking, which I think is about 20 minutes or so, uh, please do be thinking of any questions or comments that you want to talk about. Uh, at the end of my talk. So I'm not doing PowerPoint, um, so I'm going to draw with my finger uh, the shape of our times. It goes a bit like this. Um, it's an exponential curve, and it's extremely relevant to news media. Uh, the explosion of internet usage, uh, the surge of the smartphone, uh, the rise of Facebook, Google, and the tech giants all follow that shape. Uh, and recently, so too does the growth in audio devices, um, Alexa and her friends. Ten years ago, Facebook's audience was in the tens of millions, still pretty big. Today, it's 2.2 billion. That's more than a quarter of the people on the planet. And the really extraordinary fact to me is about 1.5 billion of those users log on at least once a day. There has never been a platform of such reach in the history uh, of media. And there has certainly never been one that has risen so quickly. And it isn't alone. Google, Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube have all seen explosive growth driven by network effects. The impact has been enormous. And it's happened so fast uh, that the implications have uh, far outstripped awareness of the risks and the dangers. So for the news media, um, where I come from, the impact on business and business models has been profound. So print advertising. For newspapers, the traditional main revenue stream has suffered steady annual declines every year for the past few decades um, and a cumulative collapse. In the US, newspaper advertising revenue was $60 billion in 2000. By last year, it had fallen um, by two thirds. But it wasn't just that advertising revenue went from print to digital, uh, it also went from print to digital to Facebook and Google. Those two platforms now account for more than 80 cents of every new dollar in digital advertising. So the rest of the media 
newspapers, radio, um, all of us are left fighting for the crumbs. And unsurprisingly, that's had a deep and difficult impact uh, on news organizations. Many publications and some great brands uh, have disappeared from print uh, or entered um, what I see as a death spiral uh, of cost cutting to survive, shrinking newsrooms and losing quality to try and stay profitable. I grew up reading Newsweek, um, for instance, once a home of, of great reporting and reportage. It ceased the print edition some years back, and as a shadow of its former self, ditto the once great LA Times with 40-something Pulitzers to its name, um, and many other titles across the US and Europe. Regional and local press have been hit even harder. When I was a foreign correspondent, um, publications like the Boston Globe had strong international networks. Uh, no longer. Uh, the local press, traditionally a training ground um, for national journalists and a vital watchdog for local government, um, has been decimated. More than 200 papers, local papers, have closed in the UK in the past 10 years. The number of regional journalists has halved to around 6,500. And just as traditional media has been hit um, by the rise of search and social media, um, so these platforms have also spread the virus of low quality and fake news. It's a double whammy of damage to quality and traditional uh, publishers. Fake news is not new. Um, back in the 1920s, ahead of a general election, the Daily Mail splashed on the Zinoviev affair, um, a report that Soviet authorities were calling on their comrades in, in Britain uh, to rise up ahead of the general election. That was a rather dramatic example, but not unique, as John Lloyd um, uh, who is co-founder of the Reuters Institute here in Oxford uh, and a former FT colleague uh, wrote, lies, seduction, persuasion, flattery have all been part of the feedstock of political, of politics and journalism for centuries. But what is new um, is the scale and sophistication of fake news and crucially the financial incentives driven by advertising that reward scale uh, and sensationalism. This is not just about specific intervention on particular stories like the Zinoviev affair. There is now a system and an industry at work. Bots, automated systems designed to imitate people, have become a powerful force in driving fake news. Troll farms um, have been spreading misinformation and sowing uh, discord at industrial scale. And we're now entering a new phase with doctored fake video. Uh, researchers from the University of Washington um, developed an algorithm and used a neural network and computer-generated images um, to quite literally put words in President Obama's mouth. So seeing may no longer be believing. So it's hard, of course, to measure precisely the impact of fake news, but you don't have to be precise to be perturbed and disturbed. Ultimately, democracy depends on informed choice. If the information system is corrupted, then the choice isn't informed. And more deeply and more darkly, um, there are questions about choice and agency itself. So take fake news. In the final three months of the 2016 US election, according to a study by BuzzFeed, the top performing fake news stories on Facebook generated more readership than the New York Times, NBC, the Washington Post. Uh, a report, for instance, from the Denver Guardian uh, about the suicide of an FBI agent suspected of leaking Hillary Clinton's emails was shared 100 times a minute on Facebook. It wasn't just fake news, it was a fake publication. There is no Denver Guardian in Colorado or anywhere else. So did fake news give us the Donald? Um, clearly there were bigger socio-economic forces at work, um, but fake news had a real effect. A study by Ohio State University found that voters who switched from Obama in 2012 to Trump in 2016 were influenced by a handful of fake news stories. Um, a senior ex-Googler I met uh, in the Valley, Silicon Valley, a few weeks back told me how the news um, that the Pope had endorsed Trump, changed the vote of many in the Filipino-American community in Fresno. That's just one example of a broader pattern, uh, troubling enough. Uh, 
But beyond this information problem, there's also, as I mentioned, a choice and an agency problem. On one level, there is the silo effect. Uh, we all see it and we all suffer from it. Social media creates echo chambers, apart from your mad aunt or mad uncle, we all have one. Um, your Facebook feed probably reflects and reinforces your own views, your biases and your prejudices. Fill those echo chambers with the emotive and toxic tales of fake news and you have fuel for the polarization and partisanship that we're seeing in politics and populism pretty much everywhere. Again, though, the technology takes us even deeper uh, and even darker. The recent revelations around Cambridge Analytica were disturbing on a number of levels. First, the abuse of personal data, and second, the way that data was used to manipulate subtly, invisibly, uh, and systematically the political decisions that people were making. Of course, the company had a vested business interest in overstating this influence, um, but I wouldn't take any reassurance from that. Cambridge Analytica was not an isolated instance, nor the only player using user data to influence sentiment. Though I should point out that Oxford Analytica, where I started my career, um, <laughs> just down the road, is a high quality news and analysis organization, uh, as the name suggests. Um, again, the important point is that the risk of abuse um, is systemic. Uh, to quote Tristan Harris, a former, a former Googler and now an advocate of platform reform, phones, apps and the web are so indispensable to our daily lives that we've become a captive audience. Technology companies have inadvertently enabled a direct channel to manipulate entire societies with unprecedented precision. As he argues, technology platforms make it easier than ever for bad actors to cause havoc pushing lies to specific zip codes, races, or religions, creating millions of fake accounts and bots impersonating real people with real sounding names and images. So it's deep uh, and it's global. So far, most of the examples I've cited are from the US. That's partly because the US is the home of the search and social media platforms in question, um, and partly because the US has been sort of first mover in the downhill slide of fake news and falsification. But this is a global problem. In the UK, the Brexit debate was riddled with false and fearful claims about immigration and the NHS, though in quaint Brexit style, sometimes using big red buses uh, in place of digital technology. Arguably, arguably the biggest dangers, though, are in developing economies and developing states, whether it's the Philippines, um, whether even fewer established local trusted media to offset the impact of Facebook and social media um, players, or in Myanmar, where social media has been used to incite anti Rohingya uh, sentiment. In one party states, such as China or Russia, where the techniques of digital surveillance and digital media manipulation make the dawn of democracy more distant and the fictions of 1984 more factual. So I've also talked a lot about Facebook. It is, of course, at the center of um, the current storm. And as The Guardian put it, uh, no other organization in the history of the world has had the impact Facebook has on the news ecosystem. Almost half of Americans say they get their news from Facebook. Uh, but there are, of course, other giant uh, tech platforms. Uh, it's wrong to lump them all together although I think it is right to recognize that they also bring risks. Google, for instance, is now engaging constructively with news organizations and publishers like the FT to develop more sustainable business models such as subscription systems. But there are risks and, dist and distortions too in its search engine and algorithms. Research by Robert Epstein's team at the American Institute for Behavioral Research found, for instance, that the autocomplete uh, on Google search where you start typing a query and then Google presents various automatic suggestions has significant influence, not just in the search, but in the actions that follow. And one experiment showed how autocomplete prompts could shift voter preferences by determining the information presented to the user. So at the heart of all this is the fact that the algorithms that drive search, advertising and other platform behavior are not nor can be neutral and independent. They are opaque creations of human programmers 
and they fulfill a function a lot like editors, but without the news experience, journalistic training, or regulatory oversight. So, now that I've probably um, depressed or alarmed you, um, I feel the need um, to suggest some measures uh, or some response. Um, as you'll hear, that's hard, uh, and it is necessarily multidimensional. First, and importantly, so-called traditional media mustn't be a passive player. At the FT, we moved early and fast to transform our business model, um, moving away from dependence on advertising to develop a subscription model with direct reader revenue. This was more than 10 years ago. We were pretty lonely back then. Um, I remember touring the US when we launched um, this new model and being criticized uh, quite sharply by audiences, particularly on the West Coast, for daring to charge for news online. The internet wants to be free, I was told. Um, so that charge was both weird um, and deceitful. It was weird because the internet doesn't want anything. It's a channel. Um, <laughs> but it was deceitful because the myth that the tech giants were and are providing free services is one of the biggest canards um, of recent business history. For over a decade, they were perpetrating one of the biggest value exchanges of our time, their services for our data. So the FT's approach, um, controversial then, has now been vindicated and imitated. We have more paying readers, more subscribers, than at any point in our 130-year history. And we're showing that quality news can be good business. Uh, we've had to make deep and very difficult changes um, to how we operate and what we do. Uh, been a lot of change, a lot of movement. Indeed, the only constant through our transformation has been our commitment to quality, independent, global journalism. And that constant is proving vital as readers seek um, a trusted source and a trusted guide amidst uncertainty and the mistrust of media more broadly. Uh, if you're wondering why there's a picture of St. Bernard there, that is our symbol, one of my favorite ads. No words necessary a trusted guide in a storm of mistrust. Both the Brexit vote and the Trump victory, for instance, brought significant bounces in our subscription base as readers looked for a trusted source, a trusted guide. We're also very fortunate that our owners, Nikkei of Japan, share our vision and our values and take a long-term view rather than chasing quarterly earnings. Um, ownership and stewardship really matter. And we're not alone. Um, the New York Times and some others that have adopted our reader revenue and subscriptions approach are seeing similar rises uh, in paying readership. But it's short-sighted and not smart to separate ourselves from the degradation of trust and sustainability of news media more generally. And to that end, other publications need to move faster and more fundamentally to build new business models. Too many publishers bet the farm on building advertising audiences on the platforms that are replacing them. And they have discovered in the process that the hard truth that advertising alone will not sustain the size and the quality of newsrooms needed to produce the craft of quality journalism. Is regulation of social media required? Yes, but not as we know it. Some form of regulation or governance is required because it would be naive to expect the actors to address these issues themselves. The Zuckerberg apology tour has gone global, and I believe he's actually sincere. But successive mere culpas and commitments to fix things suggest Facebook and others struggle to keep pace with the uses and abuses of the platforms and the systems they've created. As Mark Zuckerberg himself put it, they are in an arms race, and they're building an army. Facebook alone has several thousand fact-checkers and fake news police. Um, but it's a bit like that arcade game, um, Whack-A-Mole, where you shut one troll farm, you block the Denver Guardian, and another one just appears somewhere else. And as with the video CGI case I mentioned, fake news keeps mutating, keeps evolving. Also, the search and social media platforms are ultimately businesses. They're focused on revenue and returns and not necessarily or primarily on social responsibility. Their culture and their business incentives are among the reasons we are where we are, and it's pretty hard to change the culture of an organization. And finally, the stated intentions of the platforms may be credible. They may even be admirable, 
Google's mission to organize the world's information is a valuable objective, though only if the information is worth organizing. The intentions of abusers, however, are far from noble, and the unintended consequences enabled by huge systems um, with huge and deep data uh, databases are by definition uncertain and potentially hazardous. So self-regulation won't be the answer, then why not regulate like the rest of the media? And there's clearly a case for consistency. So-called traditional media faces significant regulations, and rightly so, um, within the limits of press freedom. The fourth estate, like all estates, needs governance. The scandals of phone hacking in the UK uh, were one reminder. And it seems asymmetric, to say the least, to give the largest and most pervasive publishers of our time, the big platforms, a free hand. And yes, they are publishers. Despite their claims, they are more than utilities or platforms. They have systems and algorithms to decide what material is presented and to whom. And that, for my money, sounds a lot like publishing. But the traditional roots of regulation fall well short of what is needed. First, these are global borderless players. There is no global regulator. And the regional and national regulators can't do the job, even on a regional or national level. I don't know if you saw the US congressional uh, hearings of Facebook following the Cambridge Analytica affair, but they were lame and they were limited. Um, the recent EU hearings were frankly little better. The reality is that existing regulators are not up to speed with such a fast-moving complex and technological phenomenon. There has been some positive action and there are pointers to further measures. In the US, the big tech has a privileged status under Section 230 of the Communications and Decency Act, which gives it exemption um, from liability uh, for nearly all kinds of illegal content. But that protection has seen some cracks. Uh, for instance, Congress voted to end immunity uh, for websites that facilitate sex trafficking, uh, a signal that they could take further steps to hold platforms more accountable. Don't hold your breath, though. Um, the lobbying spend of the fangs as they are known, is formidable. According to Recode, um, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google spent a combined $50.50 million last year on political lobbying in the US alone. And indeed, new regulation may prove counterproductive. Uh, GDPR, um, the EU data protection regime that came into effect just two weeks ago, um, has many positive aspects. Um, but ironically, it may reinforce, not reduce, the dominance of the platform monopolies. Information is power, and data is information, and now it's going to be much, much harder for new players to get the millions of permissions needed to generate the data that drives a search uh, or social media <coughs> giant. The scale and complexity of the challenge means that new, broader, and deeper measures are required. This is a global problem, so the response needs to be global. It is multidimensional, so a new effective governance regime would need to involve the key stakeholders, the platforms, media uh, and government. Um, it needs independent expertise and analysis, and I reckon academia might have a role to play there. Effective governance would certainly need to get to the operation of the algorithms at the heart of these systems. That has generally been a red line um, for tech giants. They make the reasonable point that transparency around algorithms would enable um, enable those algorithms to be gamed by market players. But there could at least be a set of legal and socially acceptable principles that could be verified and could be audited. Specifically on fake news, there are of course many problems in definition and identifying trusted sources and quality news. It must be partly subjective and of course that raises questions and risks around censorship. But here too there are ways of addressing fake news more effectively at the scale and speed that is needed. I talked about this recently with Krishna Bharat, the founder, one of the founders of Google News. He believes a coordinated approach where technology can recognize and flag the fingerprints of fake news virality and where human judges can provide experienced judgment when those flags are raised could detect fake news in real time and put the brakes on before it spreads too far and too fast. Maybe. The point though is that this is the kind of new thinking that's required to address this new problem, and it's urgent. We've already seen enough to know that the corruption has spread further than we feared. As Mark Zuckerberg said, for the first 10 years, everyone was just focused on the positive. We, all the stakeholders in this sector, need to address these risks 
so that we can return to the potentially powerful and positive um, aspects of digital media, the ability to reach readers globally, efficiently and dynamically, as we're doing at the FT with new forms of journalism uh, and storytelling is an inspiring uh, opportunity. So my entire career has been in the news industry, both as a journalist uh, and as a CEO, <coughs> both sides of um, church and state, though um, after 30 years I still don't know which is church, which is state. Um, and I hope that some of you are drawn um, to the fourth estate as careers. It's a tough neighbourhood, um, but in terms of experiences and mission, it has few equals, and that mission has never been more important. So, thank you all for listening, um, and now I'm very happy with Guy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, John, thank you for joining us and for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions before opening up to the audience. Um, first, I'd like to ask, uh, pick up on something you said about the Facebook and Cambridge Analytical sc uh, scandal. I think it became quite clear from the congressional hearings um, that a lot of US lawmakers, and I'm sure it's the case for lawmakers all over the world, have no idea how social media actually operates. Yeah. Um, to what extent, uh, what do you think it will take uh, for the government to come up to speed on how to actually regulate um, the service, as you said, if you don't think that tech companies can actually self-regulate themselves. Yeah, so when I was actually in the Valley two or three weeks ago, um, there were some t-shirts doing the rounds um, at Facebook, which is, it's advertising. And um, what happened was, you might have heard one of the Congress people said, but, but you're free, so how do you make money? And I think, you know, that's kind of shows the level of not understanding how these players operate, because it's advertising is the answer. Um, and I think in general there's just a lack, and I think, you know, to be fair, it has happened so, so quickly. Um, but that's no excuse, really, for government to not be better informed about how these things are operating. Um, I think in Europe um, there's definitely a recognition of the risks, and I think the European Union and the Commission have been quite um, focused on this and um, more expert. Although, as I said in my, in my um, comments, there's a risk of um, some of the regulation being counterproductive, like GDPR. I do feel, though, um, even after something like Cambridge Analytica, there was a little bit of heat and noise around Congress, a kind of sense that mm, this is a problem. But two or three weeks later, it became clear that nothing was really changing. I think Facebook put out their uh, results. <laughs> they were record levels of advertising. Advertisers had stayed very loyal to the platform. And as I mentioned, the lobbying power um, is phenomenal. They are the biggest lobbyists now in DC, and that tends to be pretty effective in terms of stopping changes in legislation. And I think as well, the other dimension, which is really quite interesting, I think came out a little bit in those congressional uh, hearings, was the competition in particular with China and Russia. So I think that the sense in America that you need to be at the forefront of tech and this innovation around platforms is actually, there's, a, there's almost like a national interest in, in being at the forefront of that. Uh, and they don't really want to lose ground to China or Russia or others. So it's regarded as a strategic sector, understandably and rightly in many respects. Um, but I think that also is likely to get in the way of regulation or reform. Thank you. Um, so you also said that um, when the Financial Times first started putting um, its content behind a paywall many years ago, many were reacted with skepticism or hostility. But then um, after many years, a lot of um, other um, news companies like the New York Times have followed suit. Um, to, to what extent do you think that high quality news sources going behind paywalls has actually opened up a vacuum for fake news to kind of capitalize on the lack of free supply of news sources? Mm. Well, that is, of course, one of, the, one of the charges or one of the risks that actually, um, obviously, if you're behind a paywall and charge, the whole potential of the sort of democratization of quality information you, you know, is, is, is obstructed because not everyone can pay and particularly not everybody in poorer countries can afford to, to take a subscription. Um, so, but I think the way around that is we do make material free um, on social media and elsewhere, um, not necessarily all of it. Um, but it's kind of like if, if we can't have a business model that sustains quality journalism, then nobody gets quality information. So it's trying to get that, that balance right. And I think probably a solution um, could be reached. Certainly there's, if the platforms engage in supporting quality journalism through enabling some kind of reader revenue model on their platforms. Um, it's not hard to envisage a way 
that you could actually create and provide quality journalism through those platforms. The problem has been that they have been um, very slow um, and resistant uh, to, to uh, embrace some of those changes. As I said, Google is beginning to, um, but Facebook not so. Thank you. So you said in the past that your passion for journalism made the decision to become CEO much more difficult, um, since the FT is very clear about uh, the difference between editorial and the business um, and strategy side. Mm. Um, why do you think that division <laughs> is important? Well, two things there. The division is uh, very important because editorial independence is absolutely crucial um, to our entire culture and DNA. And I find it quite hard. It's a bit like um, Dr. Strangelove when you know he's always kind of putting his hand down like that. And I love journalism, I love writing. Um, and it's a very strange thing being a CEO when you don't actually control the product. So if I don't like the front page, although I always love the front page of the FT, nothing I can do about it. That's purely in the editors and editorial domain. And I think you just have to be very respectful of that. And I think it works very well because, you know, I used to write stories and work when I was in the editorial team very closely with the editor. Um, so he knows that I know that he knows that I know where the lines are drawn and, and it works very well. But I think it's what readers expect. They want that um, editorial independence, and I think that is central to, to what we do. And therefore, to your <laughs> first point, moving over the fence from editorial to business was probably the hardest decision I've ever had to take. So mm. my final question before I open up to the audience, what initially sparked your interest in journalism? What made you pursue that career uh, initially, especially growing up in, in Asia? Well, I'll be honest that um, I thought the appeal was, was sort of, I was always interested in current affairs and indeed when I worked at Oxford Analytica and David Young is somewhere at the back there, uh, well, right there actually, um, you know, the sort of the, the current affairs and what's going on in the world and as a student of PPE was relevant and interesting. But I think wrongly I sort of thought that I also like writing and actually most of journalism isn't about fine writing, it's about getting the story um, and getting the story and writing it in a very concise and clear way. But um, if I'm completely honest, uh, and one of the reasons I moved over to the business side was I always felt I had limits as a journalist because a good journalist um, doesn't really worry about ruining somebody's day. You have, to, you have to just write the news and just that's all you care about. And I struggled with that. I'd wake up at three or four in the morning thinking, oh God, um, if I ruined somebody's day, did I get it completely right? And um, so ultimately, I thought I was probably more inclined to business <laughs> at some point. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we'll take questions from the audience now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to reach you. Um, so for the first question, we'll go to the hand um, all the way in the back, yeah. Um, you were talking about your move to a subscription uh, business model. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about other media companies that have seen uh, relative success in the last 10 years and maybe alternative models yeah. that have also been successful? Yeah, um, so I think that um, there's a kind of a handful of quality publishers that have moved to subscription models. There's us, the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist. Um, and I think you know they're all doing pretty well from that reader revenue model. There is an argument that's often put to me, well, that's all very well for you to say that. You're the Financial Times, you have rich readers, they can afford to pay subscriptions. Um, <laughs> Which is partly true, but only partly true, because I think that any, um, any publication needs to differentiate itself to be successful. In fact, any product, anything, needs to have some point of differentiation to make it special, to make people want it for that reason that makes it special. And therefore, it gives you something to charge around, whether it's a brand, whether it's a, a columnist, whether it's a, a particular tone of voice. There should always be something in a, in a publication that makes it special. And if you haven't got that, then what are you doing? So I think there's always something to charge around. Um, and you don't necessarily need to charge, you know, we're, we charge more <laughs> than most um, in the subscriptions game. But you don't necessarily need to if you've got a, a broader scale audience. So I do think some kind of reader relationship uh, is possible for pretty much any publication. And a publication that can't charge readers for what it publishes should be asking itself, why? And if it's not worth anything to its readers, what are you doing? So I think it is open to everyone. But I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all approach. I think there's different ways of thinking about this. I think The Guardian, for example, has more of a community, a voluntary contribution scheme. Um, and you know that's a different way of of going about things. It, I think, probably reflects more their uh, culture and their heritage. Um, 
but that's actually a viable uh, approach. Um, what I do think, though, is that it's going to be very, very difficult for a publication to succeed on advertising alone just because of the market um, economics around advertising and just the gravitational force and sophistication of Facebook and Google make it incredibly hard to compete for uh, advertising. So maybe in, in certain very niche areas, really specialist areas of coverage, you might be able to do that. But I think it's pretty tough for anything beyond that. Thank you. Um, next question will go to uh, the gentleman in the white shirt. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned China several times, and I was wondering what your current um, the number of readers are in the country um, of the Financial Times, and what's your, oper uh, your operating strategy for China, and uh, how do you make your voice heard in such a tough environment? Yeah, well, it's well timed because we were talking about that. I came straight from a board meeting today, and that was on our agenda today because um, it's been pretty tough uh, in China, but it's coming good. Um, we've been so. We have a sort of Chinese language edition called FT Chinese, um, and it translates articles from the FT and also adds some original content. And it's been um, pretty tough going. I mean, obviously, there's been times when there's been disagreement with some. Of so we were very clear from the get go that we wouldn't self censor. And I remember when we started the project and I was presenting this to the Pearson board, Pearson used to own us in those days. I said, look, you just need to be aware. We all need to be aware that this is the one, one business that we're going to build that could be turned off overnight. And if we're not comfortable with that, we shouldn't be doing it. Um, so we kind of were pretty realistic. And there have been moments when um, it's been um, problematic. Um, and you're never quite sure specifically which story it is that's caused the problem. Um, but you certainly see the reaction. Um, but what we have done is to build um, a very loyal and engaged reader base there. I think we have over a million um, registered users. We are the biggest um, international publisher of news in China. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of others have tried. New York Times, um, Wall Street Journal, they've, uh, they've, some of them have been shut down. Um, it's a very difficult environment. Um, but we um, are growing. Um, we remain true to our principles that we will not self-censor. We will publish what we think is of interest to our readers in China, whatever that is. Um, and I think it's important. I do think you know, part of our mission um, is to take global information to readers everywhere. And you know, China's the world's second biggest economy. You cannot be a global business publication and not take China seriously. But you have to do so in the right way and on the right terms. And we won't compromise our principles. Thank you. Um, next question will go to the hand um, just behind. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, I'm really curious um, the role you think antitrust law might play in some of the uneven advantages and the, the playing field issues that you discussed in terms of um, FANG, but I think social media in general. Um, so if you think of the 50 different acquisitions that Facebook made recently to get IP, to get talent, to get platforms like Instagram and WhatsApp, there's really nowhere that users can go to escape some of these larger companies. And it makes their power in terms of the data they have much larger. Um, where would you fit antitrust law in some of the recommendations you made? Um, and how do you think those types of laws could be passed and made effective? Yeah, so it's a very good question. And I think it's, again, there's a complete asymmetry. So in terms of anti-competition policy, you know, if, if we want to, as we are, sell a small uh, asset um, in Germany, um, there's very robust national uh, competition law. Um, and it's ridiculous. The size of the asset we want to sell is tiny. Um, but we have to go through the process. The, the asymmetry arises, and of course, you know, the big um, tech platforms don't encounter that very often. Maybe if they were to buy another big tech platform, they might encounter it. But the real issue is it's that um, distinction between cross-border and global players and, and national players. And the, the real problem here is there is no um, effective international cross-border uh, regulatory framework for competition, for um, uh, media standards or, or any standards in, in that area. So I think that is going to be a real problem because these are all cross-border sort of transnational players and they're, you know, therefore they're, they're huge and that's one of the symptoms of their size. Um, I, you know, the ideal scenario is some kind of international agency that thinks in that way about global competition. But I can't see that happening anytime soon. Um, so I wish 
<laughs> I think there should be. I completely agree with the sentiment of what you're expressing. I'm just not seeing a practical answer anytime soon. Thank you. Um, next question, we will go to um, the hand just over there. Right. My question relates to um, the immediacy of need for news. And obviously, you, I think, do two formats on your sort of phone application for the Financial Times. One is to get the news straight away and the other is to wait for the morning edition. And mm. I was just wondering sort of what the difference is between how those two different formats are prepared, what the sort of, what different quality you get, and then how do you compete with people like the BBC who are shooting off news basically every other second to, to our phones? Yeah, um, so the life of a journalist has changed completely since I was in the newsroom. And it used to be pretty straightforward. You just had a couple of filing deadlines for the print edition. Uh, and obviously now people are filing short takes for online. They're doing video. They might be doing podcasts. They're doing the, the newspaper filing too. So the multimedia um, dimension um, is very real and very deep. Um, but you therefore need to be quite clear about what you're trying to achieve and not get carried away uh, in the sort of endless opportunity just to do, try and do everything at once because you, you won't do quality news. So, you know, I'll view a, a number of aspects that. One is um, be right rather than fast. You know, make sure that what you've got is A, correct, and B, adding value. There's no point just feeding the flood of information. And I do think we think about it in those terms. There is a flood of information and you can drown in it. People do. And you just get this wall of stuff. And I think our, our um, purpose uh, is to filter that stuff. So the editor refers to the FT sometimes as the filtering times because what we do is organise, filter, prioritise. Um, people want to know. One of the beauties of the newspaper, which I believe in, um, is that there's a hierarchy of stories. Um, and, you know, experienced editors making judgments about what matters and why. Um, and I've, my view is that with digital uh, channels, you can have both. You can have your cake and eat it. You can personalize news feeds to people so they get what they're looking for, when they want it, quickly. Um, but also they can look at the broader agenda in terms of what the FT thinks is important or what, um, uh, you know, what that sort of global dimension is. But, you know, it does, it comes back to this other crucial point about data and data analytics, which I think are transformational. Um, you need to get that balance right because what you don't want to do is just follow the traffic. And I know there are news organisations that look at what's hot and then they deploy their reporters to follow the story because it's hot. Well, I don't really see the point in that because you know, there's nothing original about that. You're not really adding value, you're just chasing the herd. So we use data to um, inform um, decisions, to inform the deployment um, of resources, um, but not... That we, not so we can chase the herd. And I think it's very important for quality publications and for people in general to um, have experienced editors making calls about what matters and why. Thank you. Um, next question, we'll go to the gentleman in the red shirt. Thank you. Um, so I would like to know what you think about the recent uh, fake assassination of a Russian journalist in Ukraine? and its impact on the image of the media, especially since he reappeared at the press conference. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that's a difficult one. <laughs> um, I think, you know, um, that's a complex story with lots of dimensions, but ultimately, I guess my instinct is you just have to be very careful and kind of avoid. My, my instinct would be to... Um, I mean, you know, there are obviously specific circumstances in that case, but in general, I don't think fabricating news is a wise route to take, whatever um, the broader pictures. I think it's risky. Thank you. Um, next question. We will go to um, the hen just behind. My question is with regard to traditional media and how they have failed in, say, the Trump elections or Brexit in mm. calling it right and therefore the rise of social media mm. and the public's use of social media and new media in relation to in and ignoring what traditional media has to say. Mm. I think the first point and it's an important point is um, you know and I, I don't think it was just about Trump or Brexit I think the same thing happened in um, one of the Indian general elections eight or ten years ago 
quite often reporters don't get out into the country. <laughs> they, they kind of um, uh, are in, indeed in their own sort of echo chamber, generally in metropolitan areas. And I think um, if people had got out and about uh, in the Midwest and really taken the pulse more systematically, I think they would have recognized that there was a reason um, for Trump and it wasn't just fake news and whatever the you know, whatever the uh, influence of fake news, it was operating in a context where there was, you know, deep dissatisfaction with the way um, the country and, you know, the elites um, had been operating. So I think that lesson, one of the lessons is to make sure you get out and about as a media organization and hear all the voice and understand um, how strong they, they can be. Um, and then I think uh, another dimension is, and I think one of the, one of the problems when I think about particularly in the US, just the polarization of news there is striking. There's like two organi you know, different organizations just talking to their own people. There's no cross uh, information. So you know, whenever I go there and check into a hotel room, um, I see how long I can resist before um, turning on Fox News. And it's kind of like, I kind of don't want to, but I sort of do want to because I just need to understand. And it's always, wow, um, this has got even worse. Um, and they have this technique I call the sofa technique, where they have like three people on a sofa. And I think the idea is to the viewer that it's um, creating a range of views, but the, the views start pretty, pretty far, <laughs> and then they kind of go off the spectrum. So I do think that polarization of news and information um, is a real problem because you know, the, the liberal media is talking to liberal readers and that's it. And um, the more conservative media are talking to conservative audience. And, that's not healthy. Um, as a quick follow-up question, so um, one of the things you mentioned is uh, about the importance of setting the, uh, you know, choosing which stories are important. Um, in the 26th election, um, the, s the weeks uh, before the actual vote, um, the single most covered issue was Hillary Clinton's emails. Mm -hmm. uh, and many blame, you know, the agenda setting power of news media um, to blame for that. To what extent do you think that's true um, of, news companies actually choosing um, what news to cover, um, to cover other stories? Of course, of course, I was on the business side then, so um, I didn't get involved in editorial coverage, and also I don't think we did do that. But I, I think a lot of it was, as I was saying earlier, that the amplification effect of social media to drive those stories with, with um, I mean, obviously they were a factor in mainstream news coverage, but they were huge on social media. And I think that was a lot to do with the techniques of bots and driving stories to um, to mass audiences, so I don't think necessarily there was, you know, that wasn't just about experienced editors making decisions. That was a much more systemic uh, problem. Thank you. Um, next question. We'll go to uh, the gentleman in the uh, red jumper. Thank you. Um, one of the problems we have at the moment, I think, is difficulty in distinguishing between fact, opinion, theory, and hypothesis. And uh, we're well used to, um, I think, journalists and others treating opinion as fact. I think the mm. slightly more nefarious tendency in recent times has been, especially within the BBC, I suspect less in the case of the Financial Times, the tendency to treat um, fact as opinion. And therefore, in the interest of balance, if somebody states a fact, and this was very much the case in the run-up to the referendum, um, a, a simple economic fact is stated, the BBC feels obliged to say that was an opinion let's hear the opposite point of view. Um, and this, this happened repeatedly. It, it's, it's really quite um, upsetting to the, the degree to which it happened. I'd be interested whether you perceive that yourself and what can be done about it. Hmm. So well, I, 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 um, it's an interesting um, question. And I, I always hesitate about naming or referring specifically to other news organizations. And I am a fan of the Beeb, but I think to take a general um, point, I do think it's part of the, one of the problems we're talking about, which is um, the, the sort of competition for attention and the kind of dramatization um, of news on the one hand, that um, bringing opinion into, so news can, be, can, can come across as quite dry and sometimes it needs to be hammed up a bit. And I definitely think that's been a trend. I also think you've got to be a bit careful because sometimes, in in what you're projecting as balance, there isn't necessarily balance. You're, you're, I think your point is you're creating an imbalance by trying too hard to have a balanced discussion. And I think that, frankly, quite often shows weakness in judgment. I think a good journalist and a good editor 
um, knows the story and doesn't feel the need to add bells and whistles and fake balance. They just tell the story. I think the way we think about it is there's a very clear distinction in our news pages um, and our comment and opinion pages. Our news pages are just straightforward news. Yes, obviously, you know, if there's a claim and there's a valid counterclaim uh, or an allegation and a defence, that's for the completeness of the story. But that's a judgment call about what merits um, response in that article. Uh, but on, on the comment and opinion pages, I think the thinking there is to, to deliberately try and bring a range of opinions around a particular theme or subject. So there's a very clear distinction between the two. And I do think you're right um, that in a lot of media, the opinion does creep into news. And I think that is quite subtle, quite insidious and uh, not healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, we'll go to uh, the hand just halfway down. Um, the ref, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering to what extent do you expect a further concentration on the market for quality uh, media outlets? And also, do you see in, in um, other language communities? I mean, in the Anglophone world, it seems like the potential readership is huge but in smaller language, linguistic communities, um, it's, it's more difficult to uh, uh, switch to a subscription-based model. Mm. Now, um, do you see that as a danger to the democratic information system? Yeah, I'll take the second point first, and I think it's a huge danger, and I don't think it's, under, I don't think it's sufficiently recognised. We talk a lot about, and I did, um, you know, the US and Facebook and UK and Brexit and whatever. But actually, I think the really big problem is in emerging and developing societies and um, states because there is no mature, quite often there's no mature um, uh, news brands, um, no trusted news brands. And it's very easy for social media, either the global players or even local players to, but typically the global players, to um, become very dominant very quickly with nothing, with no checks and balances. So I mentioned um, the case of um, Myanmar, where you know, I think it's pretty clear that um, social media platforms have been used for, um, to incite anti-Rohingya sentiment, and there's lots of other cases. So I, I absolutely worry a lot about that. I think that's deeply problematic. Um, and then the first question was consolidation. Um, Probably. Um, and I do think there's like a hard core of survivors in terms of global quality news. And I think there's five or six of us and we'll be there, I hope. And, um, but I should also say that, you know, there are some really quite good, innovative new news organizations um, that have healthy business models, um, that have some good um, editorial, do some great stories, do some great work. Um, so I think it is quite a dynamic environment, and I do think there are new players emerging all the time, and some of them will thrive, but it <laughs> shouldn't be this hard, I think. If I, just, if I may just make a further uh, small point, would you rule out any um, ideas for state support in infrastructural um, ways that still allow for healthy competition mm. at all? Or, or would you consider that... Um, as a possibility if, if there's really uh, a, a, um I mean, there's been some debate. I mean, look, to the, to, to the, to the extent that people recognize that you know, news media is in, you know, faces serious challenges and is at the same time fundament, fundamental for a functioning democracy or political system, naturally you think of alternatives and there's been philanthropy, there's been state support. Um, I'm pr very skeptical. Um, I don't like the idea of state support in any way for media. Um, Maybe with the sort of the infrastructure, as you say, there is um, something that could be done. But I just think market intervention and government intervention in information tends to end badly. Um, philanthropy is slightly more interesting, um, and I think there are, you know, you can conceive of philanthropists um, supporting news um, news organisations. Again, you know. What happens with the second generation, the third generation? What does it do to the, the competitive playing field? So I'm wary. Um, I think that's probably a less bad scenario than government support. <laughs> but I think the right scenario is for a market that functions with the right governance and regulation and, and um, uh, absence of distortions. Thank you.
Um, we have time for two or three more questions, um, so we'll go to the hand just over there. <coughs> Getting to meet a lot of hands. <laughs> So obviously, due to your position, you're talking and tackling this problem from the perspective of a journalist and a news source. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, if you step back from that and view it just as a systematic issue and in human nature that we're just driven to do clickbait, that we're driven to want information for it to be free, especially in America, um, that'd be a huge principle to challenge to say that we should have to pay for it. To, to the masses. So what do you think, you know, taking back and looking at it systematically and from a human nature perspective could be done to help shift our values and shift our behavior um, that's broader than just in the journalism space? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, the saying is you get the government you deserve and probably you get the media you deserve. And the reality is that, um, you know, people do, you know, people, people do get addicted to social media. I mean, I struggle, right, um, clicking through and it becomes addictive and, and there are very smart, um, uh, I was going to say people, but very even smarter algorithms that kind of know what I want to see and are very good at giving it to me and there are techniques that just take up too much time. So I do think it's an act of will to improve uh, things and I think um, people will have to understand um, where this is leading and, and the kind of quality of information they're getting. And, and the habits that are being formed are not necessarily, or definitely not necessarily, healthy habits. I think the problem has been that it's taken a long time for some of those realizations to catch up with the habits. Um, that you know, you know, all the, all the way through this, people didn't realize that they were handing over really valuable personal data um, for a long time. And you know, the 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 use of phones um, for information all the time has become a obviously a habit. So I think that. I think awareness and, and it sounds kind of lame, but I think <laughs> awareness and education at a personal level are actually pretty important. Um, so, as you know, you're right. That is kind of, we, you know, it, it wouldn't be a problem if we hadn't brought into it ourselves. Thank you. Um, next question, we'll go to the member just there. Hi, thanks. Um, there are people who, rightly or wrongly, accuse the FT of being a bit of an ivory tower in journalism. Um, and all this sort of talk about uh, St. Bernard's and the Fourth Estate and the speaking truth to power reminded me of that scene from Yes Minister, where someone walks in, a civil servant walks in with a copy of the Financial Times, it turns out he hasn't <laughs> actually read it, he just considers it to be part of the uniform. Yeah. Um, so my question is, if we associate oh. quality oh fake news fighting journalism with expensive journalism and with complex journalism. What's the outlook for your average person who walks into a supermarket buy a newspaper or turns on Twitter who doesn't have either the money to pay for the FT or the time to wade through what's frankly a, a very complex and difficult paper to read? Yeah, so there's a number of dimensions to that and I'll try and address them all because they're good. Um, first thing is, actually I would, but I, you know, I think I can, with evidence, reject the ivory tower point. So some recent stories we've done about people being paid below the minimum wage in Leicester, um, some really good investigative reporting into what it's like in Blackpool now, um, what happens when um, there's deindustrialization. So I think we are, and, and that's just in the UK, globally we do a lot of detailed reporting on issues that matter to society in general, and that's part of our mission, part of our responsibility. So I think that is not an ivory tower perspective, that is a, a much broader sense of responsibility and, and mission. And while we do write about global business, we also hold it to account. Um, so, so that's one point. The second point, I suppose, is about the, the charging for journalism. Um, but I think a bit of perspective is needed there because frankly, we are cheaper um, than a double espresso from Starbucks, I think. Um, and when you think about the value of what we're doing to readers and uh, I think and the complexity of that and the fact that a global newsroom doesn't come cheap, um, I think that's a reasonable price to pay and I think quite often people don't make that connection. Um, so, you know, we don't get that many complaints about price but when we do I tend to point out the coffee thing and people go, oh, oh yeah, okay, um, fair enough. Um, so I, I think they've just got used to information and news being free. And there's no reason why it should be. Nothing else is free. And if people want quality information, they should be prepared to pay for it. Even, you know, it's not a huge amount. But I also think that the mindset there is not, we're not in the business of maximizing profit. 
Um, we're in the business of generating enough return so that we can invest in our newsroom and create quality journalism for everybody, for as many people as possible. Um, and that's the way we look at things. So, you know, we're not driven by quarterly earnings. We're not publicly listed. Our owners, frankly, are wonderful. They, they, they need us to be profitable because they want us to sustain, not because they want to reap a huge dividend. Um, so I think that, that all matters. Um, and I think that we do see our mission as much more, um, much more than reporting for an elite. And I, you know, I think you're, you're right. If you wind the clock back, um, maybe it was a little bit like captains of industry and mandarins, but one of the reasons that's changed actually is that the newspaper, much as I love it, is no longer our dominant channel. Two thirds or more, three quarters of our readers are digital. And it used to be, you know, you used to look out of the window and see people walking across London Bridge carrying this. And it was almost like a, a kind of branding thing. It was like, look at me. Uh, well, now, of course, people, you can't really see that online, but we have a level of engagement and loyal readership that we've never had before. So I think what that tells you is that we are not just a sort of emblem or a badge or a status symbol. We are valuable, meaningful news and information that people find useful to understand the world in which they live. Thank you. We have time. And by the way, if I may just add, we're free for students. That's the other thing. We want, <laughs> um, we want students to read us um, as much as possible because we think that if <laughs> not that we've given up hope with this generation, but certainly the next generation should have a fighting chance. So. Thank you. Um, we have time for one final question. Um, so we will go to um, the gentleman in the third row. Hi, I'm from South Korea, and I used to work in Israel and Palestine. And while staying there, I'm experienced in working with uh, Korean writers dispatched from Korean news media companies. And I have two questions. So first question is, uh, I'm wondering that what brought you to South Korea? Mm -hmm. And what did you learn while staying there? And then what is the difference between the FT or and South Korean the news media market? And second question is that uh, in South Korea, News, news media company highly focusing on domestic issues rather than international issues. So the way they bring some information from outside is that, is that the dispatching some, some writers to UK or Israel and Palestine and then write, writing some report barely. Mostly they are just translating the, the translating from other news medias like FT or BBC. Mm -hmm. So I would like to hear some advice from you that how is this the right way or is there any way uh, to be improved? So point number one, thank you, because I have very fond memories of um, it was my first posting as a journalist in South Korea, Seoul, and um, that was in 1890 and just after the transition to democracy. Um, and it was the reason I went, because it was an incredibly exciting story, because you got to cover politics, business, obviously the risk of North Korea, which remains. Um, we won't get into that, could, could be a whole other hour. Um, but um, it was a very dynamic, as you know, very dynamic society. For a, for a reporter, it had everything. Um, and I particularly remember being tear gassed in my sitting room because I left the window open and there was a big riot going on. There were lots of riots in those days, but it was a fantastic transition to democracy story, quite inspirational. And I always felt actually that the media in South Korea was pretty good. I mean, they were very, very competitive, um, very hard charging. Um, and I, I, I might disagree a bit with you in that I think they always had, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a bit less so, but they always had quite a good international, they had correspondence everywhere, uh, not everywhere, but like for, um, a, you know, they had a strong, a lot of the newspapers and TV uh, companies had quite big foreign networks. And they were particularly interested, obviously, in what was going on in China, what was going on around German reunification in, in Europe, obviously, because of the Korea Peninsula situation. Um, but maybe what's happened is the same thing that's happened everywhere, which is what I was talking about. The economics of news media is a global problem. Um, and running expensive bureaus um, is tough. And when I was based in Seoul, the, the, the Foreign uh, Correspondence Club, which was basically a bar, had journalists, quite a good bar, had journalists from everywhere. It was just really exciting. You had reporters there from the Boston Globe, Miami Herald, um, most of the UK publications, European publications, and all the wire services. And now I suspect the FCC would be lucky to have you know, 10 or 15 representatives because the economics of having 
international um, bureaus, um, it's incredibly expensive. So by default, people then turn to syndication, to agencies, unless there's a huge story when they can justify the expense of deploying people. So I would regard it probably um, as a broader issue of the economics of news media rather than a South Korea perspective, because my experience with South Korea um, was always um, very internationally focused, as you'd expect from a big trading nation. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking John for joining us today.